Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Sure, I'm glad to see you. I hope that you had a wonderful week celebrating Memorial Day. We did. We had an opportunity to go down to the family's place in Florida uh, for a few days this past week and uh, had time with Ethan. It was magnificent. We celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. It was just one of those. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of those uh, fantastic weeks that uh, we all need to, to decompress. So if I have a little extra energy, it isn't just the coffee this morning. Uh, it's the opportunity I had to you know, stick my piggies in the sand and just be with the family. So today we're going to begin our new message series for the month of June based on the book of First John. And the series is entitled Prove It. Now, the whole idea about this series, based on the f- book of First John, it's really a letter, it's only five chapters, it's really quite short, uh, is it talks about the power of love that God has for us, and the love that God wants us to have for other people. And we probably have heard, or maybe even used, that cliche that revolves around the idea of no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. In other words, it's not just what you say, it's how you live your life. It's how you put your faith in action, and we know that that comes to us through the power and the gift of love. And so as we go through the book of First John this month, uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and read it and, or listen to it through the audio Bible. It'll only take you a few minutes, but it is well worth it, and hopefully you will find it to be inspiring. And we're going to find uh, several wonderful powerful themes that will propel us through this, not just this message today, but this entire series. And so I want us to begin by reading, we're going to read the whole first chapter of 1 John. It's only 10 10 verses. We're going to separate it. We're going to break it down in verses 1 through 4 and then 5 through 10. So let's read our uh, first part together. And using the English Standard Version, or the ESV, as it, as it were. These are the Bibles that we passed out to our graduates for Graduate Sunday, uh, and so I wanted to go ahead and use that, put these to good use uh, this month for this, season, for this series. So, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, again, well, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Other translations say, so that your joy may be complete. I think they're both right, right? We want our joy to be complete so that we can share that with other people. And so when we look at this, this first section, you know, the fancy word, I always try to uh, not to uh, use it all the time, is pericope. Pericope is a fancy word that means our section for today. But what this talks about here in this very first section, our pericope, uh, as we begin our series, is that Jesus is real in every sense of the word. Jesus is real in every sense of the word. Now, when we look at the first part of 1 John here, does it remind you of anything that perhaps you might have read before? Say the Gospel of John 1. That's right. The Gospel of John chapter 1, right? So, it, it, it's the same dude, right? In the same words. I mean, same words, basically. That was a little, uh, I guess, a little too casual. It was the same apostle scripting the same words. But the whole idea is, is that John, who was the disciple that Jesus loved, as he referred to himself in the Gospel of John, is writing this letter to John as well. And in the writing of the letter, what we see is he is starting his letter, reminding everybody what he wrote in the Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And those who believe in Jesus as the Son of God are given eternal life. And as a gift of that eternal life, they are brought into fellowship as God's own children. So the first part that we read here in 1 John echoes what we see also in the Gospel of John. But then what we see here, John takes it just a little step farther. 
when he talks about how Jesus is real in every sense of the word. He talks about how what we saw Jesus do was real. What we heard Jesus say was real. The touch that we felt with Jesus was real. All of it was real. He's real in every sense of the word. Jesus is real. Now the other thing that John does here is he takes it by using this idea that we saw it with our and experienced Jesus with our senses. It's for this reason that we proclaim it to you. So that you too can experience that Jesus is real. That you too can see the effect of what Jesus has done in people's lives. That you can hear the message. That you can, as the Bible also says, taste and see that the Lord is good through things like Holy Communion. You can experience the realness of Christ right here and right now. John wrote these words certainly after Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection and his, and his ascension and ascending of the Holy Spirit is what empowers and enables us to be able to experience fully who Jesus is and what Jesus did and does for us. And so this proclamation, what John is trying to do is to make it personal. John wants to take this idea that Jesus is real and make it personal when he's talking about the relationship that God and the Son, God the Father and God the Son with God the Holy Spirit, what they all have is a relationship that can be made personal for you to make Jesus real in your lives. Now, it may be a little bit more difficult for us that we don't see Jesus walking the earth. That we don't necessarily hear the words coming out of his mouth. But that doesn't mean that we can't experience Jesus in every sense of the word in the here and now. Jesus talked in John chapter 3 when he met with Nicodemus using the idea of the Spirit and paralleling that with the wind. He says, you may not necessarily be able to see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind, right? You can see when the wind makes the leaves or the tree branches rustle. You can see when they fall. You can see when tumbleweeds or litter or whatever uh, is being tossed around. You can see the effect of the wind. And we likewise can see the effects of God in our lives and other people's lives. We have this ability to experience or to see with our own two eyes how God works, how God's miracles are being made manifest. We can also hear how Jesus would speak to us. Maybe not with the words of his own mouth, but when other people are proclaiming the word of God and how it's made manifest, telling their story and testifying to who Jesus is and what Jesus did in their lives. We can make it personal. And we can even do things like sharing a casserole with somebody. You know, great old southern thing, right? When someone's going through an illness or a death or something like that, you can take them a casserole or maybe have a cup of coffee with them or something along those lines. And you can taste and see, you can experience the fullness of what happens. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus was made known after his resurrection to a group that was on their walk to Emmaus and the breaking of bread. And that's why Jesus said, when you eat the bread, taste and remember me. The whole idea is to make the principle personal is to make it personal. This weaving of our lives together where we see and know and hear and smell, all of our senses are activated with the love and the grace of God. Jesus is real in every sense of the word. And so if this is being the case, then we have a responsibility ourselves to make sure that we are proclaiming the reality of Christ, that Christ lives with us today. We have that responsibility, but with that responsibility, there also comes a caution. So let's dig into the second part of our for the day, which comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. So this is what John continues to write after making sure that everyone understands that Jesus is real. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, we see that John is making the point that Jesus is the principal character in the story of redemption. He wants to make that principle personal, and Jesus wants to have a personal and saving relationship with every single person. But there's a problem, isn't there? There's a problem, and it's called sin. Jesus wants a relationship with us, with you, personally. But there's a problem, which is sin. It's imperative that we look again at the idea of what sin is. It's a Greek archery term, which means to miss the target, to miss the mark. And sometimes we miss the mark because we aim poorly or we don't aim at all. Sometimes we aim properly, but we do not take other environmental uh, factors into, uh, into account. Or sometimes we do our best to aim and we still miss all the same. Sin is a Greek archery term, which means to miss the target. The target is the principal redemptive person in God's story, which is Jesus. And sometimes we can miss the target. And if we think about taking environmental factors into account, what we can glean from this is the whole idea of darkness being part of the problem into which we have to live and deal when we think about our own life and our relationship with God which comes to us through the forgiveness of sin in Jesus, as well as with other people. And so what we see that John wrote in this is that we all have to deal with the idea and the reality that darkness is all around. That darkness is all around. Now, John did deal with this in his gospel when he talked about how Jesus being the light of the world and the darkness cannot overcome it and doesn't even understand, it can't even comprehend why it doesn't work, why it can't overcome, but that doesn't mean that it ceases to try. So when you look at the Greek word for darkness, that what we see in this verse here, in verse 6, is that it has a very specific meaning, and it can be seen and viewed in two ways. It, of course, is the, the darkness that settles over the earth, right? And it can be a physical darkness or it can be a spiritual or metaphysical darkness. But the idea behind the darkness that we get from the Greek is that it gives people the illusion that we have the cover, the cover of night, so to speak, the cover of darkness, that we have the cover that we need or that we desire or we want or we crave to be able to do the sinful things that we should be freed from. That was a lot of words, but hopefully you caught the drift, right? It can be a physical darkness or metaphysical darkness where we think we have the cover of darkness to be able to do what it is we really want to do. And therein lies the struggle that every single human being, regardless of their relationship with Jesus, must wrestle with when it comes to the idea and the reality of sin. Sin is one of those things where If we think we do it in private, if we think we do it in the dark, no one's going to know, no one's going to get hurt, no one's going to see, no one's going to have their senses activated to realize that we have gone against God's will and God's way and God's word. We're not just talking about (laughs) robbing banks or stealing Amazon packages from someone's front porch in the middle of the night. We're talking about those things deep within us where we think, No one will know. No one will see. No one will care. And it doesn't matter. But it does matter. Because in God, there is no darkness at all. To him, the darkness is as good as light. And so the things that we think we may be able to conceal from God, the reality is that God sees them all the same. 
And so this means that we have a problem with darkness in the world as well as in our inner world, the outer world as well as within the inner world. So let's take a, a deeper look at the whole idea of darkness here and how it corresponds with those who have not yet received Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life as well as those that have. So the first thing that I want us to consider about darkness is that it refers to a life without Christ, plain and simple. So people who have not experienced the love and the grace of God through Jesus Christ are living and walking and working through darkness because they've not had the spiritual light come into their heart and into their mind, their soul, their life to illuminate the reality and the truth of God. I think the enemy wants it that way, which is our second point. Darkness is an active opposition to God. Now, one of the things that... Uh, the, I think it was C.S. Lewis, I think it was, anyway, but one of the things that's been written and said is that the devil's greatest victory isn't in convincing us that God doesn't exist, it's that the devil doesn't exist. Think about that. The devil's greatest victory isn't in convincing us that God doesn't exist, but the devil doesn't exist. And so as a result, people have this kind of warped or mixed up idea about what evil really is. It's not just some nebulous force. It isn't just something that settles on us and rises again. It is an active force of evil that is explicitly and intentionally trying to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. I can't say it enough when we go back into the, into the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, and Satan's basic temptation is, did God really say just to try to get us to question, to warp our idea and our thoughts about what it is that God wants from us and desires from us. We talked about it some in our last message, in our last series in May, about holiness and righteousness, to get right for God, to be uncorruptible, and to not use our lives in a corrupted or a common fashion, but to be set apart for God. And we have to realize that there is a force in this world that is actively and intentionally trying to turn the lights out on you to get you to question and to think, is this God stuff real or does it even matter? Darkness is an active opposition to God. And as a result, darkness sows chaos. Ooh, right? Darkness sows chaos. Think about getting up in the middle of the night to go potty, or, you know, I know that was a really technical term, but, you know, or to get a glass of water or something like that. Um, but just an experience from this past week. Now, I know the, the family condo pretty well, but I'm still leery of getting up in the middle of the night in the darkness because I don't know it really well. Now, at home, whenever I were to get up in the middle of the night, I don't have to turn on any lights at all. I can just get up. I know right where the doorknobs are. I mean, I basically know how many steps. You know, all that muscle memory. I can go to the, uh, the toilet. I can go to the sink. I can, you know, whatever I need to do. I can just go do it. But in unfamiliar places, it's not as easy. And you need a little bit of light, right? So what the enemy wants to try to do is to try to, first of all, use our unfamiliarity against us by causing us to constantly be seeking and searching but to also use our familiarity against us. Let that sink in for a minute. The enemy wants to use our familiarity as well as our unfamiliarity against us. And then it moves us to begin to respond to love with hate. To respond to love with hate. Um, I almost showed a movie clip here. Um, for the interest of time, I didn't do it. I am going to show it at some point in the future. Um, but a couple of weeks ago during Star Wars, the May the 4th weekend, Tiff and I were flipping on the, the Star Wars movies, flipping there, and we weren't watching any of them really intently. But uh, toward the end of Episode 3, which is when Anakin Skywalker falls and becomes Darth Vader, and he and Obi-Wan Kenobi have their, uh, their duel of the fates, uh, after it's over and, you know, Obi-Wan literally and figuratively had the high ground and he defeated Anakin. He looked at Anakin, or it was Darth Vader at that point, and he said, Anakin, I love you. You are my brother. And he's 
reaching out in that pain and that grief about how did, how did we come to this? How did this famil familiarity breed content, right? Do you remember how Anakin responded to Obi-Wan with that? I hate you. I hate you. Whether it's through familiarity or unfamiliarity, when we experience love in a way that we don't want it to come, we end up responding with hate. Now, the Apostle Paul later in Romans would write something kind of cool. He talks about, you know, don't take vengeance because vengeance belongs to God. Instead, smother your brother with kindness because it's like heaping burning coals on his head. That's part of the struggle that we feel or we find when we find relationship broken with God or with other people, whether it's due to familiarity or lack of familiarity. And the darkness can consume us. And we have to hope and pray there is still a way out of it through the light. And what we see about the darkness and bringing it back in, you know, the principle of it, bringing back into the personal, is that sin is a very real threat and problem for everybody. And I have two ideas on the folly of sin that I want us to explore really quickly. The first folly is a warning to those who thought they progressed beyond the concept of sin. One of the things that we can read in the scripture is how the Apostle Paul wrote, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And so what he's talking about this is things then can become a matter of conscience for the person. Now that's not to say that we can begin to arbitrarily take God's word in an arbitrary fashion. And that is this first folly of sin. For those who want to look at this, it's like, yeah, you know, this doesn't really have to apply to me anymore, so I'm just going to go and do whatever I want to do. I'm going to intentionally enter into the darkness, even if it may be permissible but not beneficial, because when I'm in Christ, everything, you know, everything's good to go. My parenthetical statement at the bottom is enlightenment is not moving beyond God's word, but deeper into it. It's the whole concept of the why. There's an anecdote about this person who comes, or two people who come into a field and they see a fence. The first person sees the fence and says, this fence is in my way, I'm just going to take it down. The second person sees the fence and says, well, I wonder why there's a fence here. It's interesting to me with this mindset that we can slip into as people of faith and this folly of sin, when you think about fences in the Grand Canyon. Have you heard this little anecdote before? On the American or U.S. side, there are all these fences. On the other side that is in territory of Native American reservation, there are no fences where would you presume there would be more fatalities? You'd presume on the side with no fences. But in reality, there are more fatalities on the side with the fences. And that's because people get so caught up and they get so uh, brave, I guess, with the whole idea of a fence, they feel uh, the fence no longer applies to me. And so they lean over too far or they uh, go over it and they think, you know, they're while they're coding all the way down to the bottom. But for those who don't see the fence, can see the threat and keep a safe distance. It's a very peculiar thing about our human nature. And Christians are guilty of using the word of God, much like people who see a fence at the Grand Canyon and then feel like it doesn't have to apply to me anymore. I'm just going to lean over it or I'm going to go over it next thing you know. But unlike the Wiley Cody, we don't just get up with a bump on our head, do we? It's far more tragic. The second folly of sin is a warning for those who think that sin no longer has a hold on the Christian. Has a hold on the Christian. I put a Bible verse there and uh, do not give the devil a foothold. Uh, it's actually, I 
for whatever reason, I have the wrong uh, reference here. It's Ephesians 4.27, not 4.28. But Paul talks about don't give the devil a foothold. Uh, and he's speaking specifically to people of faith, and he's connecting it directly to anger, the things that can burn us up from the inside. The thing about giving the devil a foothold is he doesn't just make do with a foothold. He grabs the whole leg. One of the things I remember loving to do as a child, and uh, my kids did it with me, is to grab hold of dad's leg while dad's trying to walk. Right? You know, I can, I can walk with some pretty good style and soul like this. But if I had a kid on my leg, it's like this, right? Dragging it. That's what the devil ends up doing to us. Grabbing on a little foot. Oh, this is fun. And the next thing you know, we can't walk properly in the light where Jesus is because we've allowed that sin to get a foothold on us. Now, friends, where we bring this idea back to the whole concept of all things being permissible but not all things beneficial is that for as many different people as there are in the world, there are that many different things that can give the devil a foothold in our lives. My struggles are not your struggles. Your struggles are not your neighbor's struggles or your child's struggles or your parent's struggles or your spouse's struggles because, you know, spouses give the spice of life. We all have individual and unique struggles. There can be a lot of similarities, but every single one of them is different because we've all lived different experiences. And as a result, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to dealing with our sin outside of saying, Dear Jesus, help me. Save me from this. Because the things that I struggle with may not be the things that you struggle with. But they can be just as deadly to the spirit and to the soul. And so we must be exceedingly careful and exceedingly mindful. So what are we to do? I'm glad you asked. I have three ideas about what we are to do. Uh, the first is keep walking in the way of God. Right? Keep walking in the way of God. Now, what's the active word, the action word in that statement? Walking. Okay. Now, we don't have to get too grammar specific here, but if you're not able to walk right now and the best you can do is crawl, you keep crawling in the way of God. Or if you've been walking for a while and you're jogging or you're running or you're sprinting, you keep sprinting in the way of God. But whatever it is you do, don't quit. Keep walking in the way of God. Whether you are crawling, walking, toddling, stumbling, bumbling, fumbling, keep going. Don't quit. The second thing is confess your sin and receive God's forgiveness. This is applicable for the non-believer and the believer alike. It is true that sin no longer has a hold on those who confess Christ as their Savior and Christ has forgiven their sins. But friends, this doesn't absolve us of the need to confess our sins. Because of what we read here, when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. And whenever we see just in there, it's God making us whole. God making us whole. And for crying out loud, don't quit the struggle. Don't quit the struggle. If you're struggling, you're growing. We cannot afford to quit the struggle. And this is where the devil insidiously comes in again and whispers those sulfuric nothings in our ears. Oh, you're still struggling with whether or not Jesus was born of a virgin. Oh, that means you don't believe. You're still struggling. Did Moses really part the Red Sea and they walked on dry land? Oh, you're struggling with the idea that Jonah spent three days in a boat in the belly of a fish. Oh, you're still struggling that Jesus walked on water. He didn't even have to split the sea. You're still struggling that Jesus could feed 
thousands and thousands of people with a few sardines and dinner rolls. We all have these struggles of things we wonder, is it true? Did it happen that way? Friends, the scripture doesn't lie. And this is what the scripture tells us. We can't, we can trust God because God is not a liar. And so we can't quit the struggle. If you're struggling with any type of sin, don't quit the struggle. If you're struggling with your drinking, don't give in, keep struggling. If you're struggling with pornography, don't quit, don't give in, keep with the struggle, get it right. If you struggle with anger, don't just give in and be burned up by it. Keep with the struggle. If you're struggling with lust or addiction, all of these things are applicable. Keep walking in God's ways. Confess your sins when you fall short, when you get it wrong. Accept his forgiveness. And then keep struggling. Keep walking. Keep crawling. Keep running. Keep on keeping on. But don't quit. And what the enemy is going to try to convince us to do is in those times we've fallen short, which we all invariably will, is to say, well, that's it. That's the last straw. You're too far gone to be saved. Sorry. Game over. That's not how Jesus works. And so that's this little three-point slide here. What are we to do? Keep walking in the way of God. Crawling or running if you must. Confess your sin and receive God's forgiveness. Don't feel that you're too enlightened to have to worry about it anymore or you can keep dabbling in whatever it is and it's not going to hurt anybody. Accept that forgiveness. Be made whole. And then don't quit the struggle. Don't quit the struggle.